Hi, everyone, and good afternoon. Welcome to the first of a three-part series of virtual roundtable discussions on advancing young adult health during and after the COVID pandemic. Uh, my name is Erin Hemlin. I have the privilege of serving as the Health Policy and Advocacy Director at Young Invincibles, um, where I've worked for nearly eight years, focused on access and coverage for young adults between the ages of 18 and 34. Uh, for those of you who may be new to us, YI is a national nonprofit organization where our mission is to amplify the voices of young adults in the political process and expand economic opportunity for all young people, centering young people of color. Now, before we dive into today's conversation, I want to acknowledge that the last several weeks have been extremely difficult for many of us. The horrific deaths of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, Tony McDade, George Floyd, Richard Brooks, and countless others have sparked protests and demonstrations across the country speaking out against police brutality and systemic racism. And just last week, a few days before the Trump administration finalized new guidance that rolls back protections against discrimination in healthcare for LGBTQ people, two black trans women were also killed. Dominique Mills was just 27 years old and Rhea, Taylor, or Rhea Milton was 25. At YI, when we talk about working to center young people who face the biggest barriers to healthcare in our work, we mean Raya and Dominique. We cannot advance the health of young advocates, or young adults, sorry, without addressing systemic racism and violence facing trans people, particularly trans women of color. So before we start, I'd like to take just a brief moment of silence to honor those lives. Thank you. Okay. Well, on top of all of this, uh, we are still very much in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, COVID-19, which has had a disproportionate impact on communities of color, has now taken 116,000 American lives. We've reached 2.2 million confirmed cases in the U.S., and cases are currently spiking in newly established hotspots. COVID-19 has clearly had a severe impact on nearly every aspect of our lives. Uh, the way we live, the way we work, and the economic fallout of the pandemic that has resulted in skyrocketing unemployment. Uh, between March and May, 31 million workers filed for unemployment, and the Kaiser Family Foundation estimates nearly 27 million people will become uninsured. Now for context, about 20 million people gained health insurance after the Affordable Care Act was passed 10 years ago. That progress has been wiped out overnight and it's only gonna get worse as this pandemic continues. Our conversation today will discuss the patchwork landscape of young adult health coverage as it exists across this country, uh, identify current disparities in access to coverage and opportunities for expanding, expanding access and closing those gaps and striving for a more accessible and equitable system for all. We are joined by a great panel today, including Andrea Harris, the Chief of Staff for Congresswoman Lauren Underwood, Sarah Combs, Senior Policy Analyst at the National Partnership for Women and Families, Matthew Snyder, Senior Policy Analyst at Unidos US, and finally, one of YI's very own young leaders, China Lloyd, an alum of our Young Advocates Program and current Youth Advisory Board member in our California office. Um, now, before I turn it over to our panelists, I wanted to provide just some background on coverage rates among young people before the COVID crisis. Um, before the Affordable Care Act was passed, about 30% of young adults lacked health insurance. Overwhelmingly, young people cited access and affordability as the two main reasons why they didn't have coverage. Uh, thanks to the ACA's expansion of de dependent coverage up to age 26, Medicaid expansion, and marketplace subsidies, that rate has been cut in half, down to about 15% for young people as of 2018. And while the uninsured rate for young adults has been drastically reduced thanks to the ACA, young people are still uninsured at a much higher rate compared to the general population, which is uninsured at about 9%. And while the ACA has helped to narrow racial disparities, young black and young Latino adults are still uninsured at higher rates compared to young whites. The lack of Medicaid expansion in 14 states, such as Texas and Florida, which have huge populations of young people, 
has left millions in a coverage gap. And just as they were in 2010, they lack access to affordable options. Oh, I think our first poll question has popped up here. Um, so as we kind of go through this webinar, we want to make sure we uh, know who you are. So please take a few minutes to fill out this poll here. Okay, great. Um, and while job losses, uh, while the job losses we've seen over the last few months uh, will certainly cause the uninsured rates to worsen, many young adults who have lost their jobs didn't have job-based coverage to begin with. Um, many young workers who have been hit the hardest, those in retail, the food and bar industry, hospitality, and others, were the first to lose their jobs and income stability, and many either were not offered employer coverage or had difficulty affording coverage on their own. Um, I think that's why in many of the conversations I have with young people at YI, I often hear a real aversion to employer-based coverage as a primary way that we get health insurance in this, com in this country. Um, many young people feel it's an outdated system, it's too exclusionary and inflexible. Um, and I think if anything, COVID has really shown a light on the inadequacies of this system as millions are losing their coverage at a time that they need it the most. And while the ACA has been, was intended to kind of address this problem by creating a marketplace for anyone to access coverage who didn't otherwise have access to it, it clearly has not gone far enough. Uh, too many young people are still left out, whether that's because they live in one of those 14 states that have not expanded Medicaid, or because coverage is still not quite affordable enough, even if they qualify for marketplace subsidies. Today, we'll talk about potential policies to address access and affordability, uh, our highest priorities in addressing the COVID pandemic right now, as well as opportunities for bolder action in the future. Now, as you listen to these conversations, um, please make use of the Q&A button on your screen to submit a question for any or all of our speakers. A member of the Young Invincibles team will be monitoring those questions and picking a few to pose for the audience Q&A section at the end of our program. Uh, you can also follow the conversation using hashtag Young Adult Health. Um, and again, we'll have a few poll questions that we'll share throughout the discussion um, as we go. All right. Now, to kick us off, I am delighted to turn it over to China Lloyd, an alum of our Young Advocate Program in California and current Youth Advisory Board member. China is also a public health student who has spent some time studying public health in Ghana last year. China, I'd love if you could start us off by sharing a bit about your experience working to expand health access in California. Please take it away. Hi, can y'all hear me? Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, I hope all is well. Um, as she said, I'm a senior at um, CSUN studying public health with a minor in civic and community engagement. I have recently came back. I'm sorry if y'all hear the baby, my niece is here. Um, I'm currently, um, I just got back from Ghana. Um, I was um, studying public health there and learning about life. Um, I was a young advocate 2017, um, my freshman year. Um, I learned a lot about access to healthcare and just civic engagement in general. Um, I, um, we, me and the other young advocates went to Sacramento to go to the Capitol building to talk to legislators about passing um, healthcare for all, specifically Bill 562 and extending healthcare um, to undocumented young adults. Um, I read an article that it passed, but I, um, in 2019, but that wasn't the case, 2017. So um, we, um, I was involved in going to um, barbershop meetings where we would go to the barbershop on Saturdays. Why I took a target approach to um, help single young men um, apply for Medi-Cal. Um, at first, that was not the case where they were eligible for it. Um, so we did take, um, we went there to kind of spread knowledge um, and help people um, apply during open enrollment. Um, okay, yeah, I think that's all. Oh, um, one of the reasons that I, this was like kind of very passionate to me, um, my, I, my mother is a Belize native. Uh, my family's from Belize. Um, my mom struggled with that, being undocumented, not having health care, and whenever my mom's, God forbid, something happened to her, we went to county hospitals and 
ranked as an emergency. And that meant I could not go to school for that day because um, she would be here all day and wouldn't be able to pick me up from school. So this is one of the reasons why I'm very passionate about um, healthcare access. Great, thank you so much, China, and really appreciate you being here. Um, I'm excited to hear your perspective as we go through this conversation. Um, so it looks like our, our poll results should be up. If you can see that, looks like most folks come from the policy and advocacy world, um, a few of our young adult leaders and a few congressional staffers. Um, so very excited to have you all join us today. Great. Um, next, I'd love to turn it over to Sarah, who is the Senior Policy Analyst at National Partnership for Women and Families, where she provides critical analysis on a variety of issues, including access to quality affordable care, transition to value-based care, and health equity. Uh, prior to joining National Partnership, Sarah worked in the Office of the Secretary at HHS, where she worked on policy development and implementation of the ACA. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Um, First, I just want to say a huge shout out to all of the young dreamers and others who stood in solidarity in the fight against um, ending DACA. Um, it's a huge victory, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, and thank you for having me. Um, it, I've been a huge fan of um, YI and all of your work. And um, yeah, it's a pleasure to, to be here with all of you today. Um, so I work at the National Partnership for Women and Families. Um, for the last 50 years, uh, our organization has focused on issues related to health justice, um, economic justice, and reproductive health and rights for women, with a particular focus on women and families of color and those who face the greatest barriers to equity and, and opportunity. Um, so with that, you know, we firmly believe that healthcare is a human right. Um, we believe that all women should have access to high quality, affordable health coverage that fully meets um, their needs throughout their lifespan. And that should be really true for all women and all people, um, regardless of their race, their, their income, their immigration status, their disability, gender identity, sexual orientation, you name it. Um, and as you mentioned, Erin, um, the pandemic has shined a bright light on the unjust health care and health inequities um, that exist for women of color, resulting from longstanding structural racism that this country was really built on. Um, it also has exposed um, the vulnerabilities in our healthcare system, um, especially with millions of people losing job-based um, health coverage, which as you also said, young adults have really had the lowest access to um, any, at any rate. So um, it has been even more important for us at the National Partnership to underscore that all women and all people must have equitable access to healthcare because our physical and our mental well-being, our economic security and our ability to participate in this society and really thrive really depends on it. Um, again, as you mentioned, you, we know that the uninsured rate uh, for young adults remains higher than any other age group and young women face a number of barriers to access health coverage and including affordability. Um, we have been supportive of a lot of legislative bills in the House um, led by Congresswoman Underwood and others um, to, to, help make, to help address those serious affordability challenges. Um, and you know, I think you know, beyond the marketplace, I think another major barrier is um, the fact that 14 states have still not adopted Medicaid expansion. Um, Medicaid is the largest uh, source uh, of reproductive health care for women. Um, in the 14 states that have not expanded Medicaid, uh, about 40% of people will lose their jobs um, and their health insurance and will end up without any kind of health insurance. So, and you know, when I think about it uh, from a race equity perspective, um, most people in the coverage gap live in the South. A greater share of Black and Latinx Americans live in the South. So state's decision not to expand, it is disproportionately harming women of color um, and just further widening um, health and health care, uh, health and health coverage disparities. Um, again, at a time when black people are dying at, um, from COVID at a rate much higher than any other race. Um, so those are the, the two major barriers that come uh, top of mind and opportunities where we could expand coverage. Um, so increasing affordability in the marketplace and expanding Medicaid coverage. Um, but I'll stop there and, or I'll actually just wanna highlight one more thing, um, and Andrea might touch on this. Um, we, we are, on a, we are uh, experiencing a crisis on top of a crisis. 
uh, long before COVID, there was a maternal health crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and there still is where black and indigenous, indigenous women are dying at um, from childbirth and pregnancy related um, complications at two to three times the rate of white women. And so there are pr provisions um, like uh, providing continuous coverage of care for one year postpartum that could really meet the needs of um, providing continuous coverage for postpartum women, uh, especially women who uh, may face chronic uh, health and mental health conditions um, after birth. So I'll pass it over back to you. Great, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much um, and really appreciate you highlighting all of those um, really key statistics. I think that uh, I was on a, another webinar about a week ago talking about Medicaid expansion in the fight of COVID and I think there's somewhat of a perception that it takes a really long time to expand Medicaid when depending on how prepared the state is, you could actually move pretty quickly and we could if states were active and, and chose to um, could actually expand their Medicaid programs and implement it in a matter of months and actually work to fight COVID over the summer. Um, so really appreciate that. And I'm excited to kind of dive in deeper um, into your remarks in the Q&A. Uh, okay, great. And um, next, I would like to turn it over to Matthew Snyder, who is a senior po policy analyst at U Unitas US's Health Policy Project. Um, Matthew, please take it away. Oh, I think you're still on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ryan, and, and I'd like to thank again Young and Mentals for inviting us to participate in this conversation. It's um, it's great to be on this panel with so many people who've made some some great points um, that I would, would just echo. Uh, so for those of you who may not know Unidos US, you might know us by our former name, the National Council of La Raza. Now, for over 50 years, Unidos US has been the nation's largest Latino civil rights and advocacy organization, working to strengthen opportunities and increase opportunities for the nation's nearly 60 million Latinos. Given that Latinos are the nation's youngest racial or ethnic group, we know that um, any conversation around young adults and, and health coverage has to take into consideration the needs of young Latinos. The median age for Latinos in the US is, is 28, compared to around 43 for non-Hispanic whites. So we know that Latinos will continue to play an even bigger role in the years to come in defining the, the, the health and well-being of the country in the long term. Uh, so I just want to kind of quickly go through some sort of big picture disparities that Latinos face in terms of access and coverage overall. And then I can also give a little bit of texture to the particular barriers that immigrant Latinos and immigrants broadly face in accessing coverage. So since the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, at least 4 million Latino adults have gained health coverage, including over 900,000 Latino young adults between the ages of 19 and 26. Unfortunately, Latinos still remain one of the most uninsured communities in the country with an average uninsured rate of around 18% uh, compared to 5% for non-Hispanic whites. And although we know that Latinos, um, you know, prior to the pandemic, and, and unfortunately they're suffering severe job losses as well, had one of the highest labor force participation rates in the country, they're also more often likely in jobs that have less access to employer-sponsored insurance. We know that around 18 million Latinos in are enrolled in Medicaid, including over half of Latino kids, which means the policy changes on that program have a particularly disproportionate impact in affecting Latinos' access to coverage and care. Unfortunately, we do know that Latino non-citizens face even more challenges to obtaining quality and affordable coverage. Um, Latino non-citizens have the highest uninsured rate among all non-citizen groups at around 46%, which is just staggering. And, and obviously the administration's anti-immigrant rhetoric and policies have only made families more reticent to enroll themselves or their children in programs that they're eligible for. We know right now that lawful immigrants remain subject to a five-year waiting period to access public health programs like Medicaid and CHIP even after obtaining legal status. And while states do have the option to suspend that for pregnant women and children, about half of states still haven't done so for pregnant women and 16 haven't for children. Thankfully, the ACA didn't subject marketplace access to the same waiting period either to purchase coverage or to qualify for the tax credits. Nevertheless, young adults with, with DACA status do remain locked out of the marketplace, Medicaid and CHIP, as well as all undocumented immigrants, which has resulted in about 40% of those with DACA status still being uninsured and nearly half of undocumented immigrants. And as everyone has, you know, has said, to, we have seen a number of disparities in how COVID-19 is impacting communities of color, including Black and Latino Americans. According to recent CDC data, around one third of all COVID cases are among Latinos, which is 
nearly twice the share of their population. So it's, you know, it's severe and staggering. Um, but I think it's important to remember that prior to the current pandemic, advocates and policymakers, as we've discussed here, did know where many of the gaps and the disparities, disparities were in our existing health system. But what we've seen over the past several weeks is that for those who were already vulnerable under our existing health system, they're now at increased risk and even greater risk when that system is put under increased stress. Recognizing that, we do know that there are options federal and state policymakers still have at their disposal right now that they could take up. Obviously, Medicaid expansion is one that has been mentioned. And other states have implemented some of these policies. As China mentioned, Medicaid and coverage in California was expanded to undocumented young adults up to age 26. And as has been mentioned, we still have 36 states that have taken up the option to Medicaid expansion, which has provided coverage to over 3 million Latinos. But as Erin as Aaron pointed out in her, in her opening remarks, states like Texas and Florida and other states that have large Latino populations have chosen to forgo expansion, which has continued to deny coverage to thousands of Latinos. I think as others have said, you know, the current pandemic has made clear that we're all better off when everyone has access to quality and affordable health coverage. And with nearly 20% of the people living in the United States being Latino, I think it's clearer than ever before that the nation's long-term health and well-being will depend on making sure that we're attentive to the health needs of young Latinos. Thank you, Ryan. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I also, I meant to say at the beginning, as Sarah said, congratulations to you and everyone at Unidos US on the historic DACA decision today. Um, I'm sure you all have been celebrating, we've been celebrating at YI, um, just really thankful that, yes, thousands of, of, hundreds of thousands of young people will now have that protection. So congrats to you and thank you for all your advocacy on that as well. Um, okay, great. And then lastly, oh yeah, thank you. Um, it is my privilege to turn it over to Andrea Harris, the Chief of Staff of Congresswoman Lauren Underwood of Illinois. Uh, Congresswoman Underwood has really been a champion of healthcare policies um, coming out of the House, taking action on addressing affordability, ensuring plans are actually comprehensive. Um, Andrea previously spent several years at HHS under the Obama administration, and prior to that was with the Senate Health Committee. Um, Andrea, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for having me. Um, it's wonderful to join you today. Um, as you mentioned, I work for the Congresswoman Lauren Underwood and the people of the 14th District of Illinois. Um, but Lauren is a, a nurse and a public health expert um, and takes a health lens to nearly everything we do in the office, which is just a tremendous privilege to be able to work with her. Uh, one of the first things she did was found the Black Maternal Health Caucus in spring of 2019. So just after having been sworn in, she co-founded it with Congresswoman Alma Adams of North Carolina um, and uh, has, has made tremendous progress on uh, developing policy that will uh, fill gaps in existing policy to uh, end maternal health disparities and elevate the issue within Congress. Um, I want to thank Sarah for mentioning uh, the Healthy Mamas Act. Uh, that's our, our Illinois colleague Robin Kelly's bill that would require states to expand Medicaid for a full year postpartum. Uh, that would make an enormous impact in saving lives of new mothers and, and young young people. Um, and we hope to get some traction on that uh, this year. But um, I especially want to thank Young Invincibles for, for inviting me to join you today. Um, uh, I've been around long enough to remember the founding of Young Invincibles, which was around uh, the development of the Affordable Care Act. It was um, established by some Georgetown law grads to uh, advocate for the um, the goals of young people in the development of the ACA and, and more, just as importantly in its implementation to ensure that uh, the ACA was implemented in a way that benefited young people. And it certainly did. Um, you know, we've seen over 20 million people gain coverage thanks to the ACA and we know that young adults saw the largest coverage gains of any age group. It was nearly cut in half. Obviously, COVID has tremendously upset that and will be um, important to ensure that future changes we make to the ACA um, can help remedy uh, some of those coverage losses. Uh, but the ACA also you know, ensured that we no longer have pre prohibitions on coverage denials due to pre-existing conditions and health plans have to cover dependent children up to age 26. Um, and as we all know, that progress 
was hard fought and continues to be hard fought and the ACA is under constant threat. It's been threatened by dozens of Republican repeal attempts in Congress. Fortunately, we have a Democratic House now, so no more repeal attempts in Congress. Um, it is threatened by the Trump administration's efforts to inject and encourage the proliferation of junk plans in the marketplace that do not always provide access to needed care like hospitalization or prescription drugs. And we know that these plans market to young people specifically and especially threaten to put even more you know, to even to put financial stability even further out of reach for young people who buy them thinking that they're um, comprehensive coverage and it's not until they get sick and have a huge medical bill that they realize that's not good coverage. Um, and we all of course know that the ACA is at imminent risk um, that could eviscerate protections for 54 million Americans with the Republicans health care repeal lawsuit, um, which continues to be supported by the administration. And so, um, but all of this progress and all of these challenges, um, Young Invincibles has been there every step of the way, making sure that the voices of young people are elevated uh, as these policies are, you know, are considered in Washington and throughout the states. I'm so glad that YI has expanded across the country um, and that they, that you all take on boldly declaring that in the US, access to quality affordable health care should not be the privilege of a few, but the right of all. So thank you so much for your continued work on that. And your voice is more important uh, now than ever as we live through this once in a generation health crisis. And this moment demands a proportional response. In Congress, we've already taken significant steps by passing legislation to ensure that COVID diagnostic tests can be provided without, without cost sharing um, and that patients have expanded access to telehealth services, which we all know young people are pretty comfortable um, reaching out to their providers over telehealth. Um, and then we've secured necessary funding for community health centers and um, providers who offer care in underserved areas. And then in the House, we've passed the HEROES Act, which would protect Americans from any form of cost sharing for COVID treatments and future vaccines. Uh, it would also establish a special enrollment period for COVID-19 and fully subsidized COBRA premiums for laid off and furloughed workers. So these are incredibly important policies that we believe the Senate should act swiftly to enact. Uh, but of course, we can't stop there. We need to do more to address coverage disparities, especially among young Americans. And to do that, we know we need to make coverage more affordable. So that's why Congresswoman Underwood has introduced the Healthcare Affordability Act, which would extend and expand premium tax credits. It would make the value of the tax credits that people currently receive more valuable, uh, which would help bring down not only monthly premium costs, but also um, the out-of-pocket costs associated with seeing a provider. Uh, and it would also make those uh, tax credits uh, available to more Americans. And we, uh, you know, projections show that, show that over 10 million Americans would see lower premiums and or, over 12 million Americans, uninsured Americans would see lower premiums. So we can insure a, around 20 million more people. And those, of course, were projections made before COVID. So um, I, I think it could help even, even more. Um, the speaker, for many of you who, who watch closely, announced earlier this week that we would expect to uh, consider a healthcare package later this month to protect pre-existing conditions, reduce healthcare costs, including prescription drugs. So um, I hope that you guys will all be engaged as, as that legislation is considered in Congress in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we, of course, hope that that will include the Healthcare Affordability Act. Um, and this will, of course, be the most significant step that Congress has taken since the enactment of the ACA to expand coverage and ensure that Americans have access to quality, affordable health care. Um, so 10 years ago, Young Invincibles helped get the ACA across the finish line and make sure that it was implemented well. Um, and moving forward, we're going to need Young Invincibles again to uh, elevate the, the voices of young people. Um, so thank you for inviting me to join you today. Thank you for the work you do. And I look forward to learning from the panelists and um, folks here uh, during the question and answer session. Thank you so much. Um, I, yeah, thank you so much for all of the work that Congresswoman Underwood is doing uh, for bringing up um, her work uh, against junk plans, I think is particularly important for young people. 
um, that short-term health insurance tends to be targeted towards that kind of quote unquote young and healthy population. Um, I think there's some of the data can be hard to come by, but United Health put out some data a couple years ago of who was buying short-term plans and 60% of them were young people between 18 and 34. And I think a lot of that is because they're kind of targeting that population of, you know, buy these plans that have these, you know, very ultra low premiums um, and young people don't necessarily know that it's not actually going to be there for them when they need it. So really appreciate that work. Um, in addition, of course, to uh, the work on affordability and everything else that is just so critical to making sure that people can access and then actually use their health insurance. Okay, so uh, before we pivot into our Q&A, um, we have another poll for you. Um, you know, touching on a lot of the issues that we just talked about, but thinking about um, our needs right now as we're kind of fighting the COVID pandemic. If there is a future package, you know, uh, pushing forth with the HEROES Act in the Senate, um, thinking about coverage needs right now, what do you think is the most important action that Congress could take in addressing COVID? Um, so I'll give folks a few minutes to, to um, pick their answers there. Um, and I would ask if you choose the other category, please uh, give us your thoughts or ideas in the chat box. Okay, great. Um, if most folks have voted, should we go ahead and see those results? Okay, we'll give folks a few more minutes. Um, while folks are filling out that poll, um, China, I'd love to start with you. Um, we've already talked a lot about how COVID-19 has just had devastating impacts on both people's health as well as their economic security. Um, and again, we've talked about how young people are especially susceptible to losing their jobs, their incomes, and their health insurance. Um, yet we, already kn we know that this was already an issue for many young people. Um, Yet the state of California has one of the stronger safety nets in terms of coverage and kind of filling in some of those gaps, some of those things we've already talked about, providing coverage for undocumented young people up to age 26. Uh, California also created some state-based subsidies to increase affordability this past year. Um, but in your work, uh, what do you see as the biggest barriers for young people in accessing coverage and care? And you know, take off mute, yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, I think there's a knowledge gap. Um, I think for one, people do not know that you um, may you time off your parents at 18 and you have to apply for coverage on your own. I for sure did not know. Thank God for YI and thank God for Kristen. Imagine advocating for healthcare and you ain't got healthcare yourself. I turned 18 around that time. So I did not, I didn't know that I had timed off until I got like a letter that I didn't have health coverage. And Kristen was like, oh, you have to apply yourself. I was like, oh, like, I didn't know that. And I mean, my mom relies on me for information. So she for sure could not tell me herself. She didn't really know. And I think the process in itself that people don't know, like, I think it can be kind of, you know, challenging to kind of figure out that process on yourself. At 18, like, I was just barely starting college. I didn't really understand that. Um, I think the um, Cover California, the website has difficulties, like uh, many people struggle with them, grown adults, fully grown adults struggle with them. So, um, and even then after I like, I find, for instance, I finally applied, they send you like two or three huge books the size of like, um, like, um, what are those things? Phone books. I, I ain't. voicemails on that I'm picking a plan and I was just sitting there looking at them like very confused on having to pick a plan mm -hmm. so when I found um finally I think they sent me a letter in the mail like this is where you go for dental this is where you go for if you want to go to doctor in your area so like I think you know the process like there's an obstacle everywhere you turn um then I also like we talked about um like I read last year they had extended it to young adults up to 26 for healthcare. I wonder if people really know that you know and even then what about people who are well, once you get over 26 and you're undocumented you just don't have health care like I worry about people like that people my family people I know you mm -hmm. know who are undocumented like so they just can't have health care um you know 
I think it's looked at as an individual issue when it comes to having um, health coverage, but it's really a community issue. We're in a pandemic where people don't have health coverage. Like, that's not okay. We should not be in a world where some people have health coverage and some people don't, you know? So that's what I know. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I think you made a lot of really, really um, good points and, and trends that I think we see across all young adults, that it's, it's difficult and it's complicated to navigate the system, even for folks who feel like they're, you know, pretty savvy with things that they can go through the application online themselves and not have an issue with that. And then you get to the plan selection area and it's, you just have no idea what all of these things mean, how to compare plans, understanding what a deductible or a copay or coinsurance are and how they all work together. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that that's a, a really big issue. Um, and then you also mentioned something that I think um, harkens back to Matthew's point on um, a real fear, particularly among undocumented communities about what's been happening through the Trump administration's immigration policies. People have been disenrolling from SNAP and disenrolling from Medicaid because of things like public charge. Even if it doesn't impact them directly, they, they fear that it does. And I think we've had a, probably a real issue with that with enrollment of undocumented people in Medi-Cal in California because you know it, it's hard to understand how all these policies work together and there's just a kind of a fear and a desire to kind of stay away even if you you have um, if you are fully eligible for that health insurance um, so yeah I think that's that's a really critical point uh, I don't know if Matthew if you want to add anything to that yeah no I mean you're absolutely right I think that um... I think it's been estimated that between one and three million immigrant families could uh, either forego or, or disenroll from Medicaid coverage based on the fear that they, you know, there will be immigration consequences, whether it's true for their family or not. I think that, you know, it's definitely just part of the same kind of rhetoric and this agenda that we've seen, you know, over the past three years. It's sort of just exclusionary with regards to healthcare and, and other, you know, programs that people rely on and, and need to have access to. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, um, Andrea, I know we've, uh, we've kind of talked about this a little bit already, but, um, you know, thinking about the fact that we've had, you know, 30 million people file for unemployment and an estimated 16 million of those, new, of those folks becoming uninsured and newly eligible for marketplace coverage. Um, but I think, as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, and as China just mentioned right now, actually, that, you know, I think there's no, never been a time where it's been clearer that we need universal coverage, that everyone needs to have access to affordable uh, comprehensive coverage. Um, and we know the ACA has filled in gaps, um, but we still have a lot of work to do. So in your opinion, what do you think are some kind of bigger picture policies that we can help young people who are currently uninsured or underinsured uh, get covered? Oh, I think you, you're still muted. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Those numbers are staggering and frankly hard to get your head around, uh, for, at least for me. Um, the first thing we need to do is defend the Affordable Care Act. If the Affordable Care Act does not it, it is is wiped out in the courts, we have nothing. We have no infrastructure whatsoever to build upon to help increase coverage. Um, so I'd say the first, like first and foremost, the most important thing that we could all do to protect the ACA is we're getting a little bit of feedback on your end. Um, is your mic maybe covered or something? Is better? Yeah, I think that's better. Thanks. Okay, sorry about that. So we've got to, we can't go back. We need to protect the ACA and ensure that it, it remains the law of the land. Um, the next most important thing we can do is build on the policies within the ACA. We have all of these sophisticated policy levers within the ACA to expand coverage seemingly overnight. Uh, if 14 states, including Texas and Florida, were to expand Medicaid, um, you know, a, over half of, of young people would be insured, uh, over half of the remaining young people who are uninsured now would be insured just through Medicaid expansion. Uh, there's legislation that has been introduced by Mark Vesey. He's a member from Texas and a fellow freshman member, Sharice Davids of Kansas, are pushing to provide new incentives to states to um, to take up expansion who haven't yet. It would give 100% uh, federal match uh, for the first three years of implementation and a pretty healthy match rate for the years thereafter. So, you know, that's one way that we could expand uh, access to 
to affordable coverage for millions more Americans. Um, and then of course, the, afford the Healthcare Affordability Act that I mentioned earlier, just make this the advanced premium tax credits more generous and available to more people. We have a really direct existing policy infrastructure to make health insurance more affordable. Um, that, I mean, we could, we could do in passing the uh, Healthcare Affordability Act and signing it into law. It could be done overnight. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I, I would think that one of the things I, I point to when we talk about affordability specifically is that when the ACA was passed in 2010, you know, we've seen inflation, we've seen prices rise, and we have not indexed those kind of primary or premium tax credits with rising costs. So, I mean, just, you know, moving with the times, I think can really help to improve the, the actual affordability in the marketplace. So thank you so much for your work on that. Um, Sarah, I'd love to go to you next. Um, I know we've already talked a lot about access and expanding coverage, but we know access alone doesn't necessarily equate coverage and coverage alone does not mean quality of care or improved health outcomes. Uh, COVID-19 has had a disproportionate impact on communities of color. Uh, as we've already talked about, it's really shined a spotlight on racism and how it impacts our health system. Um, of course, we didn't need a pandemic to know that these issues already existed. Uh, particularly for young women of color. Uh, but given COVID's disproportionate impact on women of color, what policies can we pursue right now to meet the needs of women and address these deep inequities? Thank you for asking that really important question. Um, so because of racism, discrimination, um, and structural bias, um, women have been um, systemically excluded from access to um, sorry, women of color, um, are systemically um, excluded from access to socioeconomic resources and opportunities and are uniquely impacted by adverse social determinants of health, um, like lack of educational and, and, and employment opportunities, lack of transportation, food insecurity, um, among many other things. Um, so one policy that I'd like to highlight, highlight that's not a health policy, but it's a signature policy um, area at the National Partnership is access to paid sick and family and medical leave. This is actually a racial, racial justice issue. Um, as of 2019, over 32 million workers in the United States lacked any form of paid sick days, including um, people who uh, work in the lowest paid jobs. These are people working in essential industries in which women of color, many of whom are young women, are overrepresented. Uh, this reality leaves women um, of color and all working people with the impossible choice uh, between taking care of themselves and their families and maintaining um, their financial security. Um, another is, you know, so, so, so like having increased funding and improvement uh, for uh, safety net programs like net, like SNAP. Um, SNAP is the country's largest food uh, nutrition program uh, where women of color make up a third of non-elderly um, SNAP recipients. Um, and so the HEROES Act, which passed the House last month, um, as Andrea mentioned, um, includes additional SNAP benefit increases. Um, the Senate hasn't taken, up, hasn't taken that up yet, but should quickly approve um, the SNAP boost. Another really key important issue um, is data. Um, data is, is something that we need to really start investing in and being serious about um, the collection and the public reporting of disaggregated data by race and ethnicity, gender, uh, age, language, disability, sexual orientation, and so on. Not just in this COVID-19 um, context, but in all areas of, of healthcare and research. Um, unfortunately, because public health departments um, and healthcare systems in the United States do not collect um, accurate race and ethnicity data, the full toll of this pandemic um, in communities of color are yet to be known. Um, and this is especially true for Latinx, Asian Americans, and Indigenous um, Americans. This lack of um, of, an, of accurate disaggregated data means that the current response to address COVID-19 is at best inequitable and at worst non-existent for communities. Um, 
this data reporting um, or improving data reporting um, will just not only help us understand the devastating impact of this disease, but it will inform policymakers, states, and communities about how to direct resources more, equitab more equitably. Um, and the HEROES Act, um, again, that hasn't been taken up, um, does a decent job at addressing this. Um, so I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much. Um, Matthew, um, I know you, you talked about this a little bit in your opening remarks, but I wanted to touch on a little bit more, um, highlighting the additional inequities in accessing healthcare for young Latino adults, um, and particularly that kind of intersection between healthcare policies and some of the immigration restrictions that you spoke to earlier, um, and how that's having an impact on access for so many. Um, it seems like if this administration only had two goals, it would be one, to dismantle the Affordable Care Act, and two, to restrict access and benefits and protections for immigrants. Um, when we're thinking about policies that can expand coverage for young people, how should we as advocates be thinking about centering young Latinos and other young people of color in these policies? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think but, um, you know, as we've all said today, uh, the current pandemic has, has, you know, is impacting communities of color disproportionately. And as advocates, we know that these, you know, the disparities that are getting exacerbated right now aren't ones that just appeared overnight. Um, so it's certainly no surprise that a, that a health system that hasn't been centering young Latinos, young people of color is falling short for so many of those communities during a crisis. I think that, you know, in order to prioritize the voices and needs of, of Latinos and other young people of color, one, we have to get to listen to and elevate the voices of those people who who understand their own health needs best. You know, I mean, we can't just presume that um, that we're listening to folks without sort of actually getting a, a sense and a temperature from communities that are most being hurt. And then to echo Sarah's point, I think obviously, you know, there's there's a critical need for disaggregated data so that we know, you know, when problems are bubbling from one area, we can get ahead of it as quickly as possible, and we can see where the trends are and and think about how to reverse those. I think part of the way that Unidos approaches this work and this question is, you know, we have a, a nationwide network of 300 affiliates, which are community-based organizations that provide services to their community and, and health and immigration, education, all kinds of services. Um, but it definitely gives us a kind of like ear to the ground to get a sense of, you know, what are the issues that are beginning to emerge among the community? I mean, that's one of the issues that we began to hear was that folks were confused about, well, is ACA repealed? Is it not? So they weren't signing up for coverage. Um, and, you know, we kind of get kind of like that canary in a coal mine effect through our affiliates and getting a sense from them, what is it that's most affecting them? What is it they most need? Um, you know, in addition to that, we regularly, Unidos regularly does public polling of Latinos to get a kind of snapshot, the trends over time as to what they're considering uh, the most, you know, pressing issue that is impacting their day-to-day -day life. And then again, you know, we, we continue to urge federal and state policymakers to continue to um, collect and, and make public disaggregated data so that we can get a realistic and an accurate snapshot. You know, we continue to work with our, with our partners in Congress, including the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. One of those sort of routes that we've taken recently is we worked with Representative Chuy Garcia, the sponsor of the Health Equity and Accountability Act, which is a piece of legislation that's, you know, it's very broad. It's introduced um, every kind of legislative session, but it's, it's tailored to the needs of the time. And some, it's something that centers not only the needs of young Latinos, communities of color, but other underserved communities. Um, and I think that, you know, seeing legislation like that it was even more critical before the pandemic, but right now it's a great example of how you do center these communities and their needs in a time when we really need legislation that's responsive to that, even more than we did, you know, three months ago. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, let's see if we can get our poll results. Um, I know we've talked a lot about what's happening right now, um, how Congress has already taken some action to fight COVID and some ideas of how they could continue to do so. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, so it looks like definitely the most popular options were one to incentivize the non-expanded states to expand Medicaid. Um, and then second would be to uh, create a federal SEP opening healthcare.gov up to all the currently uninsured uh, folks right now so they could sign up for coverage, um, which are absolutely things that Young Invincibles has been has been advocating for. Um, and I know several of these things were also included in the HEROES Act. I think the HEROES Act included a federal SEP for up to eight weeks. It included a 14% increase in Medicaid FMAP funding. Um, 
as well as a few other provisions. I think there is a 100% premium uh, subsidies for COBRA to help folks who are losing employer coverage be able to keep that. Um, but would love to see more action done, particularly on the affordability pieces that we've been talking about so much today. Um, okay, great. Um, so I just have a couple more questions and then we'll, we'll open it up to hear from our audience of what they're thinking. Um, but so we so far I've talked a lot about kind of our, our current right now responses to COVID. Uh, now I'd kind of like to uh, switch gears a little bit to thinking about more in the, the long term future. Um, so this is, uh, I'll start off with you, Andrea, and then I'll open it up to everyone. We'd love everyone's thoughts. Um, but uh, to you, Andrea, I've, I've seen some uh, positive support in the past, particularly on the, the kind of conservative Republican side from a few thought leaders who work in health policy about um, auto enrollment of young adults uh, into the marketplace. So both as a way to help getting those, you know, remaining uninsured young people covered, um, but also as a mechanism, you know, a stability mechanism of kind of bringing in uh, primarily younger, healthier people into the marketplace, creating a healthier risk pool and potentially lowering premiums uh, for everyone. Um, so I'm curious to, to see what you think about that idea as well as potential other areas for bipartisan support and helping to cut, close coverage and affordability gaps. Oh, I think you're still muted. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. I think I should start by saying I think we all need to be open to always to help people get covered uh, with comprehensive, affordable, quality health insurance. Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't leave any idea off the table. Um, I think Maryland recently implemented an auto enrollment policy that's going into effect in their through their 2020 tax filing, which is of course delayed and um, before uh, as they were implementing it, I think they projected that it would result in a two percentage point decrease in the number of uninsured that they have in the state. So it'll be really interesting to see um, how that plays out this year and collect some evidence base for that that policy um, and see, you know, if it does help people enroll and, and you know, what the effects of a pandemic in the, in the middle of implementing that are. Um, but we know that there is a robust evidence base for making insurance more affordable and that leading to increased coverage. So um, I love talking about the Healthcare Affordability Act uh, and, and I absolutely will. I love talking about Medicaid expansion, but those two um, you know, policies alone have a decade's worth of uh, evidence in lowering the, the uninsurance rate. And so I you know, would encourage that as an important starting point for lowering for, for expanding access to a quality of affordable health insurance quickly. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, and for folks who aren't familiar, Maryland did uh, create a state policy. I think it was just a couple years ago, and this was, should be the first year of implementation where when you file your tax return, if you uh, check box that you're uninsured but are deemed based on your tax records to be eligible for coverage, you, you can opt into coverage right then. So I think that's happening now, but I think it's maybe uh, the data might be a little conflated with the special enrollment that Maryland created due to COVID. So I know they've had a huge increase in enrollment right now, but I think it's mostly from the COVID SEP. Um, but definitely really interested to see how that plays out over the next couple of years. Um, and absolutely agree with the access and affordability piece. We are, we are huge fans of your bill as well. Um, one of the things I say often is that if we had Medicaid expansion in all 50 states, young people would have near universal coverage. Uh, the vast majority of young adults who don't have access right now are in the Medicaid gap, primarily in the South, as we've, we've talked about so often. So there really are a lot of policies that we could implement relatively quickly that would close coverage gaps. Um, but yes, I want to I want to hear too from Matthew and Sarah. Um, similarly, like where do you see momentum for progress, either in 2020 or in 2021, uh, to advance health equity and expand coverage? Uh, Sarah, I want you to go first. I'm gonna call on both of you. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Um, so. The recent murders of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Tony McDade, Rayshard Brooks, um, and countless of others, as you mentioned, Aaron, um, has um, really driven momentum uh, for movements like defunding the police. Um, the National Partnership stands um, in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and the Black and Black reproductive justice advocates that call for defunding police. Um, we support reallocating police budgets that have left communities of color under-resourced and over-policed. Um, 
um, or over-criminalized. Um, and instead, we recommend um, that money should be redirected and invested in local communities and organizations that are better equipped, for example, to help folks um, who need shelter, who struggle with a mental Ill, um, health. Um, and redirecting funds would also open up money for state Medicaid programs um, and their ability to expand coverage in their states. Um, so th that's one way that I look about look, look at this movement to defund the police, and, and I know that all the terms, um, you know, that are that are all the hashtags that are out, out there um, have different meanings, but that that's how I that's how I view it, and that's how the organization supports the, the movement. Um, beyond addressing the Im immediate crisis. Um, there lies many questions about the weaknesses of our current um, healthcare system, as we mentioned, and, and how um, we will address them in the long term. Um, losing one's job and employer sponsored um, insurance in the middle of a pandemic should be a really pretty compelling argument for universal coverage. Um, if, you know, if if things go uh, a positive way in November, um, uh, and if Biden is elected, um, he has committed to rolling out a public option. Um, and this is um, this would be like a health insurance plan or plan sold by the government um, that could be made available for for all people. Um, and you know, while the public option is a more incremental approach to achieving universal health care, um, it, it, it could still be a viable path to affordable, um, affordable health care. Um, but advocates like ourselves and, um, and, and those um, like, your, like yourselves as well would have to ensure that um, coverage is available to all people regardless of immigration status. And it, and it truly, uh, coverage truly would need to meet the, the needs of all, um, of all people throughout their lifespan um, and, and including comprehensive mental and behavioral health and reproductive health needs. Um, but to Andrea's point, the ACA provides a strong structure to build off of um, uh, like the healthcare affordability um, proposals that are out there um, that we strongly support um, that are viable and you know realistic solutions to to incrementally um, uh, get to universal coverage um, and then and finally you know as Andrea mentioned um, the the ACA is is still at great risk or the fate of the ACA is at risk and um, you know the ACA. Um, is the greatest women the greatest advancement for women's health and health coverage in a generation since its passage the uninsured rate for women has nearly halved um, and while disparities in coverage still exist women of color have experienced significant gains um, in coverage and so we should never presume how the Supreme Court um, is going to rule um, but we hope it's a it's a victory on our end. Um, because, uh, you know, victory would, would mean a huge deal towards advancing health equity. Great. Thank you so much. Matthew? Yeah, I mean, I certainly agree with, with so many of Sarah and Andrea's points. Um, you know, auto enrollment is a, is a great cool thing to enroll more people. I think, you know, in terms of sort of what's on the table and what's been discussed this year, you know, there was the special enrollment period and, and the HEROES Act is something that, um, I think it certainly opens co coverage more people. I think one point about that that sort of I want to make sure we flag is that that includes language for targeted culturally and linguistically appropriate outreach um, for that period because you know the administration has made pretty severe cuts during open enrollment periods over the past few cycles to that outreach and as well as the navigator programs, which so many of the teenagers rely on to to learn about their options and to find what makes sense for them. Um, you know, I think that there's also we need to make sure we need to recognize that. Um, the states have so many options on the plate, you know, on the table right now. You know, there's um, obviously states have taken up, like California, like China mentioned, the option to expand that coverage to undocumented young adults. Illinois last year, I mean last month, I should say, um, passed a sort of similar proposal for undocumented seniors. Um, there's, you know, there's still the state options. I mean, there's flexibilities that the, the administration has put in place during this crisis, and we want to make sure that those continue. But we also want to make sure that the ones that were on the table that they weren't taking up before, like covering pregnant women within the first five years of their LPR status, that those get picked up, that there's you know, the unborn child option for um, covering women's prenatal care and CHIP, regardless of immigration status. There's like 11 states that have picked that up. So I think that, um, you know, regardless of what happens in November and, and we're, we're as hopeful as everyone else here, but uh, 
regardless of what happens, there's still a lot of opportunities that states can do to continue to expand coverage as they have over the past several years, you know, in concert with what we saw under the ACA. Um, I think those are some good options. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I think that all of that sounds absolutely right. I mean, obviously, the Supreme Court case over the ACA is, you know, are one of the biggest threats, um, in addition to, you know, how the federal government ends up looking in 2021. Um, I think if we end up with an Biden administration, which presumably would be friendlier to ACA implementation, we could see some things reverse relatively quickly like um, funding the Navigator program, funding outreach and enrollment support, funding culturally competent uh, materials so that everyone can get covered who needs to, you know, as soon as, as January 2020, especially if we are still in a uh, wave of COVID where maybe we need a COVID SEP early in the, in the new year. Um, okay, and then finally, before we take some time to open it up to audience questions, um, I also wanna hear your thoughts, China on this question over um, kind of bigger picture policies, but then also just kind of your reaction to the conversation today, um, what you think kind of resonates with young people the most. And then before we get to the Q&A, we will have another poll question. So I'll leave that up while, while China, China answers. Um. China, you appear to be frozen, um, so I'll give you a second. Uh, oh, you're back. Go ahead. You're frozen oh, for a second, but go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, I definitely think that there. Um, it can seem that maybe young adults don't probably are uninterested in healthcare coverage, or we possibly just do not care. But I really believe that we're just left out of conversations. Um, I feel like many uh, organizations don't really tend to communicate how we communicate or reach out to young adults in places that where you know where we communicate, and that I think that plays a role in us being left out of conversations. I definitely want to thank YI for having me and and also having these conversations and involving young adults um, in these conversations. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted. <laughs> yeah, and um, because you know. It's um it's important like for us to be involved in these um and um healthcare like um I think we we are stronger as a people when we have um vulnerable communities when they're at their strongest I think us as um healthcare coverage should expand you know to many um populations that are vulnerable and that means black a lot of necks undocumented all these you know that's when we're at our strongest when vulnerable communities are at their strongest. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, great. So I think we've got a few um, questions that have come in from the audience. Uh, while we sort through those, I uh, would love to see if we can get answers to our final poll question. Um, so this is, again, kind of meant to be a little bit reflective um, on some of the policies that we talked about today. Um, but thinking about kind of efforts to expand young adult coverage, would love to hear from you all of what do you think um, should be our highest priority here? So we have a, a few options there. And again, feel free to select other and tell us that we are wrong and we should be focusing on something else. Okay. Um, so we've got some results in. It sounds like we did a pretty good job of prioritizing Medicaid expansion in our conversation because that's been ranked as the most important thing that we could do, followed by outreach support and then auto enrollment uh, for eligible but otherwise not enrolled individuals. And no others so far. So we'll continue to monitor that. Okay. Um, so here's a question from the audience. Um, is there any action to, to provide that 100% match for the 14 states that still need to expand Medicaid? We understand that we can't use any of the COVID relief dollars to do that. I know there have been um, a lot of advocacy efforts to have that included in future COVID legislation. I think it was included in one of the the House Democrat bill that came out pre the CARES Act. Um, there was that, that bill that the House Dems put out that included that, but I don't believe that made it into the HEROES Act. 
Um, so I'm not sure where kind of momentum lays on that. I don't know if uh, I see you nodding, Sarah, if you have anything to add on that. Yeah, um, there's been so many federal legislation in response to COVID, but uh, yeah, the House bill prior to the CARES Act did include um, that provision, but the CARES Act did not. Um, so, I mean, I think in terms of uh, what states, what the remaining states are doing, I mean, there, there has been a lot of, there's been action on, this, on the ground uh, at the state level. Um, Oklahoma um, has a, uh, a Medicaid expansion ballot initiative. Um, you know, but that's, that, that's, I think that's still all up in the air. And um, I do agree that there should be definitely increased federal in incentives to um, expand Medicaid. Yes, that was included in the Taking Responsibility for Working Families Act. I think that's what the name of it was. It is really hard to keep up with all of the legislation we're putting out in response to COVID. Um, the standalone legislation that I mentioned earlier that was introduced by Mark Vesey um, and uh, Sharice Davids of Kansas is called the Incentivizing Medicaid Expansion Act. Um, I don't have the bill number off the top of my head, but there's plenty of information available about it online. Um, I think Medicaid expansion is going to be an incredibly important component of any future um, efforts to expand insurance access. Um, and Sarah makes a good point that some of this expansion activity is happening at the grassroots level in states. So in 2018, Maine, Nebraska, and Utah voters voted to expand Medicaid. Um, Montana didn't, but narrowly, narrowly lost that and its, its legislature decided to extend its expansion in the end. And then this year we'll see ballot initiatives in Oklahoma and Kansas and maybe Missouri. Missouri I don't, yeah. Okay. Um, which is great. So for those of you who live in those states, if Medicaid expansion is important to you, you have an outlet um, to, you know, talk to your friends and family and neighbors about why that would be good for your community's health and economy. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing up those ballot initiatives. I was trying to remember the states too. I, I remember Oklahoma, Missouri. And what was the third one you mentioned? Kansas. Kansas, Kansas. Yeah, that's great. Um, and we've seen the ballot initiatives do really well in the states that have pursued this. And I think um, probably even more so given the kind of public health crisis we're in right now that a lot of people uh, will take action. So that's, that's great. Um, okay, so I see another question in here asking about data on the number of young people that receive health coverage through the ACA Health Marketplace. Um, so I can take that one. Um, there's a little over 3 million young adults uh, currently enrolled in the healthcare.gov states, um, and I think a few hundred thousand young adults between 18 and 34 uh, collectively of all 50 states when you add in the SBM states as well. Uh, it's generally hovered right around that level. I think there was also a fear, um, especially as a lot of resources had been defunded um, over the past three and a half years that young people would, there would be a significant drop in enrollment overall, uh, but also a significant drop in enrollment of young people. Um, when Congress repealed the individual mandate in 2017, I think there was some fear that that might lead to kind of a mass exodus, particularly of young people who maybe were only being insured because they had to be. Um, but we have not seen that happen. It's been right around 3 million um, for the last several years. Um, in addition to that, there's about three and a half or 4 million who have gained coverage through Medicaid expansion in all the expansion states as well. Okay, um, looks like this one's for you, Matthew. Um, are there any ways to get involved with the work you need us US, or sorry, or Sarah, or national partnership are doing to help advocate on priority, priorities we've talked about? Yeah, I mean, you know, you can go to our website, unidosus.org. Um, there's plenty of uh, sort of action items and, and other calls to actions that we include there on our website. Um, and you can, obviously you can follow up with me after this, and I'm happy to sort of connect with you to see what you know, particular issues are, are of interest and see where there's an opportunity to kind of engage with you and, and your state and everything. Great, thanks. And likewise, um, please find find our website nationalpartnership.org um please find us on social media and other network uh twitter instagram all the all the networks um we'd be happy to to connect with you and and get you all engaged in our work awesome thank you okay so i think we have time for one or two more questions and then we can plan to wrap up right around 4 15.
Hey, China, I see a question in here for you. Um, looking or talking or thinking back to one of the points that you made about the difficulties of navigating the system. Um, you mentioned that, you know, you were happy that you were able to work with young invincibles to kind of figure out your own navigation of the system. But um, obviously that's difficult to scale. So I wanted to hear kind of your thoughts on how can we better reach young people or really anyone who's new to buying health insurance and help them kind of better uh, understand how to know where to go, how to navigate the system and kind of get that kind of feeling of empowerment that you spoke to. Um, so I used to be the community outreach um, intern for the, um, Y office. Um, I did find it was helpful having an intern and to going to talk. To, um, I talked to my classmates. I talked to people I knew. Like, mm -hmm. I felt like we were on the same bubble, right? Um, um, I really thought the barbershop talks that, um, like, the target approach um, that why I did. I think that was very helpful. Um, where else was? Yeah, I, I think schools. Mm -hmm. Schools. Um, Cause that's, I feel like for me being an intern um, and I was able to do that for my minor and um, talk to students around, like, and I'll, you know, I was a public health major, I still am, but it was just the idea that I was able to talk about people. Like these are struggles we talk about amongst ourselves. Like, I don't know, you froze again. Well, hope, hopefully you'll come back to us in a second, but um, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think it's um, finding trusted messengers. Um, go ahead. Yeah, you're back. You froze for a second. Oh, I'm sorry. I said community colleges. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, community colleges have been a really great place for us to do outreach. Um, Pre-ACA, 80% of college community, or community college students uh, didn't have health insurance. Um, it was a really prime um, area to do outreach and education to help reach people, which I think this year will be even more of a challenge when we don't know what colleges or campuses are gonna look like this fall, um, given the COVID pandemic and where we are. Um, but I think that's a, a good one to end on. Um, really appreciate all of your participation today, your thoughtful answers to all of our questions, um, and really just the tremendous work that you're doing to advance health and health equity um, for our, all kinds of young people. So really, really appreciate you being with us today. Um, and thank you all to the audience, everyone who joined us. Really appreciate you as well. Please join us next week. Next week, we will be focusing on mental health for young people, um, which is going to be another very big conversation given everything that is happening um, and just kind of skyrocketing rates of um, mental health issues among young people and how we can address those. So I really hope you'll tune in again, same time, 3 p.m. Eastern next Thursday. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Be safe, stay well, and dismantle racism. <laughs> yeah, thank you.